show a lot of visualization gone wrong. Um, but before I do that, um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about what the midterm is going to be like since it's coming up in three weeks and you might ask this question to yourself. So the midterm, midterm will be made up of three types of questions. Uh, first, there will be theory questions. Things like, what's bad about the rainbow color scale? And explain that. Or, which channels are good for quantitative data? Uh, visualization. Then there will be a design critique, so something like we do in here and the redesign. So I'll give you uh, an example of a visualization. Like you, you can probably assume that it's not going to be the best visualization and not has optimal principles applied. And you should then critique it, analyze it, and then come up with redesigns and sketches uh, and argue your, why your redesign is good. And then uh, there will also be conceptual questions about HTML. D3 and JavaScript, things like uh, how does data binding work? How do you access the data in a selection? Uh, where is the bound data stored in a DOM? What is the DOM? Like, what can the DOM do for us? How is the DOM different from pure HTML or anything like that? Um, there will also be a find the bug question um, where I give you like a piece of code uh, and I say, okay, this doesn't render. How can I fix it? Um, and uh, then there will be, for grad students, there will be a question on one of the two papers that we're reading. Um, so anything what's in, that's in the paper, like not anything that's in the paper, but all the main points that the paper makes uh, are like subject to be questions. I'm not gonna ask you like for whatever, what is the error or the standard error for a specific uh, experiment in the crowdsourcing graphical perception study, but I'll ask you things like, uh, think of what are the benefits of using Mechanical Turk for, um, for like doing perceptual experiments, something like, something like that. So questions about uh, midterm. It's going to be a closed book. Is that in your class? It's in here, yeah. What's that? The duration? Mm -hmm. It's class time, so as long as class takes the most on R20, but usually people don't take that long. Yeah. Uh, no, this is, yes. <laughs> um, other questions? Yeah. you repeat the, what the find the bug question is going to be like Um, it's going to be, so there's like, I'll, we'll give you some simple visualization code. And we will tell you, like, this is the picture that we want to uh, create, but it doesn't do that. What's wrong with it? And again, we're not going to look for some subtleties, like uh, mistyped function name or anything like that. Uh, we'll be looking for, like, something that is conceptually wrong uh, with, a, with a visualization. Yeah? So is it safe to say, like, Fair game for conceptual questions on HTML, D3, or JavaScript. They're going to be like stuff from the book and stuff from homework, basically. Um, from like, I would say most likely if you go closely through the tutorials page that we covered, like if you reread that and understand everything that's in there, you'll be on the safe side. Uh, the book might cover some stuff that I haven't talked about. 
uh, I'm not gonna ask about these things. So if you read the tutorials, like um, you should be good. Okay. So um, next week we will talk about D3 maps, um, how we can like ma uh, draw maps with D3. There's two different ways of doing that. Uh, there is the um, like I used UnitJS and shape files. Uh, and, and do everything myself, um, and there's the Google Maps API or any other map drawing software, and so we'll be talking about those two different approaches. Um, we will use maps for the next homework. I'll talk about the next homework in a second. Uh, and then on Thursday, I'll talk about interaction. And this is like one of our papers that we'll be discussing in class, and which is also like on the test for grad students, uh, interactive dynamics for visualization. Um, that's a really good overview paper. I really like the paper a lot, so you should uh, read that closely. Um, so the next homework, this is the next homework. Um, you will be creating um, a visualization that is a little bit inspired by Gapminder. We actually use the data from Gapminder from Hans Rosling's uh, foundation. Um, and so uh, what you will do is you will create a map of the world with different countries and then a scatter plot. And that scatter plot will have three different attributes. The circle radius, the x-axis data, and the y-axis data, and you should be dynamically updating those. And there's things like, you notice like I click on a country and it's updating, um, uh, it's updating between those, and then we have an info box here where we show detailed information about each of the countries. So this is gonna be like a little bit longer homework. We'll give you like a lot of um, code already, uh, so things like Whatever sliders will be there, the legend will be implemented, and so on. Uh, so, but it's going to take a little bit of time. Um, and you should be able to do this part and all of this here basically today. Like, we have covered everything that you need to know about those things. Uh, we haven't talked about maps yet. Um, and so we'll introduce that in, on Tuesday. Um, so if you want to get started, we'll release the homework today. If you want to get started before that, I would just get started with the scatter plot. Um, and the info box and everything else, and then wait for the maps lecture until Tuesday to do that part. Even though in the instructions, the map is part one, uh, it's like probably a better approach for you guys to start with the scatter plot. Um, yeah, and after that, homework five and six will be like similar complexity, like a couple of special things in addition to that. Uh, but they will, you will be like, you'll have less of. A, skeleton to work with. Uh, we'll give you less code for that. Uh, and you also have two weeks for homework five and six. Uh, this one is still a one week homework. <clears throat> Questions about the homework? Okay. Um, great, so today we'll talk about design guidelines. And so what do I mean by design guidelines? Uh, we can draw charts in many different ways. And we talked about all those different kinds of marks that we can come up with to, for example, put two numbers last time, but we also realized that not all of those are created equal. Some are actually much better to represent the data than others. Um, and so this is like a list of guidelines that people have come up with over time um, that is kind of like um, a little bit beyond just these like very fundamental perceptual things that we talked about uh, last time. So more of like I have a whole chart or I have like a whole data set, how can I visualize this um, in a way that doesn't like bias people in a way that really communicates the data. So the rule number one um, that I uh, already mentioned last time is the effectiveness principle, and that's use the best visual channel available for the most important aspect of your data. Um, that's really something that I, I want you to think about because uh, we talked about all these different channels, and then you should really like think about what do you really want to communicate to your users. Um, and then that is what you should encode with the best visual channel available. What was the best channel for quantitative data? Position, yes. Um, rule number two is that visualization should show all of the data and only the data, which is the expressiveness uh, principle. Um, so you shouldn't like have extraneous elements that are not necessary to understand the visualization. And this one is, I think, has like it's it's a rule, but it can be 
like learn the rules and know when to break them is like a principle uh, that you should always apply. Here, I'll talk later about when you actually, when it's justifiable to break this rule. So sometimes it's, it's a good thing uh, to not do exactly that. Um, there is like another book that I recommend for these kinds of design principles. It's not a visualization book, but it's more of a story uh, of a charting book. So if you're like interested in uh, creating charts for business or whatever, um, then the storytelling with data is like really good. Some of the examples that I'll be showing today are uh, actually drawn from that book. Um, and uh, it's, it's not appropriate for like the whole class that we're talking about, but it is a very good fit for this particular lecture. Um, and so the person that did a lot of historically did a lot about like these design principles uh, is Edward Tufte. Who's heard of Edward Tufte? A couple of people here. So Edward Tufte was a statistics professor I think at Princeton, uh, and he has published these like seminal books, uh, The Visual Display of Quantitative Information, and then uh, three more. Uh, he also teaches classes, um, and so he really preaches graphical integrity and graphical excellence. Um, and his books are really like interesting reads, but I would also think of him more as like a curator of interesting historic examples. Um, I he's also like a little bit of an odd person nowadays, um, he's like very opinionated, um, and like his, uh, he teaches like these uh, visualization workshops and they don't necessarily get great reviews, but I definitely recommend uh, like reading his book, but this shouldn't be the only visualization book you ever read. So if you have read others, then you should also consider reading those. Um, and so his principle here is design excellence. Um, he talks about well-designed presentations of interesting data are a matter of substance, of statistics, and of design. Um, he is also the creator of sparklines, these like small inline line charts. Um, here is an example of sparklines um, in, um, for the 2016 presidential election, how the chances of the two candidates have shifted over time. So these are little charts where you don't have any access. You could actually embed them in text, but just by the labeling here, you get what is going on. So these are kind of well-designed and interesting charts. He's very particular about that this is his trademark, so that's why I put the TM up here. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you don't give him credit for that, he will like flame you on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> he also likes to really rant about the PowerPoint. Uh, so his point is like, PowerPoint ruins presentations. You should give people handouts beforehand to read and then only have a discussion in a meeting, for example. You should never use PowerPoint. So somebody on Twitter came up with, every time you make a PowerPoint, Edward Tufty kills a kid. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, okay, this is just a fun but, Like His integrity principles are quite useful. Uh, show data variation, not design variation. And I absolutely subscribe to that. Like, if there is a variation in the data, you should show that. Uh, but you should not show variation that is not there. Um, Clear, detailed, and thorough labeling and appropriate scales. That's very important. That's something that we kind of like often forget in visualization. Uh, when, we, when we build a visualization technique, um, the legend or the labels are easy to forget. Um, the size of the graphic effect should be directly proportional to the numeric quantities. Um, that is a very important rule. We've seen this rule broken in a couple of examples. Um, and he calls this the lie factor. And directly proportional doesn't mean that you can't do with like things like a log transformation, right? But there should be like some reasonable proportionality. So the lie factor is the size of the effect shown in the graphic divided by the size of the effect in the data. And so if you're not lying with your chart, that's going to be one. Uh, but here is a, uh, uh, well, yeah, the magnitude in the data must correspond to the magnitude of the mark. So here's a chart. Um, you will see a lot of Fox News charts today. Um, <laughs> if Bush tax cuts expire, uh, what does this chart tell us? Like this is now, and if they expire, we have this. So suddenly, we'll all pay taxes like crazy. Um, and so we can actually analyze the lie factor. Actually went in and measured those quantities here. Um, and so if we do that, we'll find that the effect in the data is a factor of 1.14. So like after uh, January 2013, uh, we will pay 1.14 uh, as much taxes as we paid before. 
Um, the effect in the graphic, though, has a factor of 5. So we can calculate the lie factor as 5 divided by 1.14. The lie factor of this chart is 4.38. This is, like, of course, illustrative. Um, but yeah, uh, the point I want to make, um, this is a misleading chart. This isn't really trying to faithfully communicate something. And we'll talk more about why this is misleading uh, in, a, in a second. Uh, so here's the actual charts if we started at zero. Um, and that's, of course, much more nuanced. Um, but of course, like starting at zero is not always the right thing to do. So you could, for example, here use a baseline of like average taxes um, that um, US citizens have paid over the last 50 years or something like that, right? You don't have to assume zero taxes is the baseline. Um, here's another chart. Um, that I like. This is from an Austrian newspaper, um, and this, this is a tabloid, like a pretty right-wing populist newspaper. Uh, and so in Austria, there is something that's called like a minimum income, like essentially like emergency uh, social security funds. And so this chart shows you um, how many people get this minimum income and where they're from. And here we have Austrians, then we have like people who we don't know the citizenship from, then we have Turkey, Serbia, Syria, and so on. And so Clearly, this chart, what is the, the message of this chart? Foreigners are taking our money. Exactly. The foreigners are taking our money. Um, and so what's wrong with this chart? Austrians are like... Yeah, so if you look closely, the labels are correct, right? There is 101,000 Austrians to take this, and there are 16,000 people from an unknown nationality. But the chart doesn't show that. The actual chart doesn't even fit on the slide here. <laughs> this is the faithful chart, right? And so here, you suddenly see, uh, like this is, yeah, sure, we, we, we're spending social security money on like, things like asylum seekers, but in comparison to how much we're spending on Austrian citizens, it's really minuscule. Um, and so if you pay attention, um, Especially if you look at biased news sources, you will find these kind of things a lot. Um, here is an even more... <laughs> interesting chart, yeah. Okay. Um, so, like, one very important discussion point is the scales. Like, many of those uh, examples that I've shown here uh, work with scales in some like deceiving way. But um, like here is the median household income in 2010 inflation adjusted dollars. Um, and so there's like, in this case, it's zero based and here it's non-zero based. Um, and so if I wanted to show a variation, like for example, the downturn after the 2008 financial crisis, um, like I could draw the orange line. And the orange line shows like to, to some degree that there is a downturn, that the uh, that the um, household income went down, but it doesn't really communicate uh, the magnitude of the problem, right? And so the blue chart instead shows like a non-zero based scale. And so like it's not completely clear what the right approach is, right? So you always have to think about this. You have to make those decisions in context. Um, and so uh, there is this um, nice video by Vox that I uh, quickly wanted to play. We make a lot of charts at most. Charts have axes, and pretty much every time we run a chart with a y axis that starts anywhere other than zero, someone winds up emailing to complain. She gives a really famous book called How to Lie with Statistics, and it contains a discussion of how you can create a misleading chart by messing with the y axis. And it's definitely true, you can do this. Here's a chart from Fox News, for example, that's a total disaster. Um, but the y axis dogmatists take it way too far. 
The big problem with people who lie with statistics is that they're lying to you. It's true that misleading charts are one way to lie, but the English language is also a tool that can be used for lying, and that doesn't mean we should never speak English. Sometimes you need to fiddle with the y-axis to tell a story properly. So for example, right now, the share of American adults who have a job has fallen to a generation-long low. It's a really big deal. But if you chart this data with the y-axis at zero, you can't see the change at all. Narrowing the range to dramatize what we're talking about isn't lying with statistics. It's emphasizing what's relevant. The way Edward Todd puts it is you need to use a baseline that shows the data, not the zero point. And after all, zero is just a number, like any other. Sometimes to make sense of the data, you need to be able to show numbers that go below zero. Halting at zero in those cases doesn't make any sense. But extending every chart away below zero would be crazy too. And of course, where zero even is depends on the units you're using. If you would chart of a person's temperature in Fahrenheit, you're likely to miss the fever if you zoomed all the way out to zero. If we do it as a Celsius chart, it's not quite as bad. But if you switch to Kelvin and extend everything to half, <laughs> when people are really lying with charts, the main thing they're normally doing wrong is leaving out the context, not leaving out the zero. Go back to that Fox News chart. You never know from this chart that the top marginal rate was 39.6 percent back in the Clinton administration, or that the Reagan administration was 50 percent, or that back when Eisenhower was president, it was 91 percent. The missing zero was really the last of insurance problems. What they left out was the entire history of taxes in the United States. So just remember, why axes don't lie to people? People do. <laughs> so this is really the point. Um, it's again one of like a statement by Topsy. Use a baseline that shows the data not the zero point. Um, and we talked about like zero points for our interval ratio data is like especially tricky, but even for ratio data, um, it doesn't like always make sense to like religiously plot um, any chart based on a, on a zero scale. Um, so this is, the, uh, this is an example um, that um, you probably have seen uh, or a lot of, on the internet that like, you can actually like show temperature charts um, that show you a downwards trend in temperature and global temperature. So this is the world average temperature from 1997 to 2012. So if I showed you this chart, what would be your conclusion without any like further knowledge about the subject? So it seems like there's some random variation, but we don't see a major trend. Would you agree? So um, this is actually the chart to put in a little bit more context. So we can see like if we fit like a trend line here, there's a very slight increase. Uh, but then here, this problem is again not like a zero chart. It's actually again this like leaving out context. And so here would be the chart if we start in 1961 instead of like um, here we started in 1999. Um, so if we start in 1961 and then we fit a trend line, that story is much more convincing, of course. Um, and we can go back further, right? But uh, and we always need to be faithful or honest about uh, like why and how we pick those data points, and that's what goes into the figure caption or the fine print, so that somebody can scrutinize your chart and make uh, make sure that you did the right thing. Um, and so here is actually an interesting blog post, and I added this to the recommended readings for this to, for today's lecture. Um, this is about basically p hacking with visualization. Um, how can we like present data or cherry pick data so that we can make a point that we want to make? Um, so here we start out with like the um, a chart of the U.S. average temperature from 1900 to 2020. Uh, but then basically this person starts to cherry pick uh, and explains in detail what what he does. Uh, but then by finding the summer average maximum temperature. Uh, from 28, uh, 1980 to 2018, at all U.S. historical climatology network stations, he will find a downward trend. Um, and there's many reasons <coughs> why, he, like how he arrived at that downward trend. One of them is that we have more uh, more temperature sensors now in more remote locations, which are mountainous, for example. Uh, and he just does average those and doesn't take account of like where those places are and so on. And so this is like. A really good exposition of how you can cherry pick 
uh, with visualization. So I do encourage you to read this. Here's another chart. What's wrong with this one? This is how uh, temperature, how 2012 stacks up, the warmest year in record. Twenty twelve is big. It's also not in order. The years are out of order, right? So, like one rule that is like very hard to justify breaking is showing time not in sequence. Um, if you show time, you should time it. Should show time in sequence, and you should also show it somewhat equally spaced. I, like okay, if this is a bar chart that picks the hottest years, I would be fine if you but don't show 1999 next to 1921 and before 1934. So obviously that that's just like a yeah, misleading chart. Uh, what's wrong with this chart? Job lost by quarter. The um, the units of time are not uniform. We have from December to so we got nine months and then we. Uh, six months, and we have three months. But there's space if they are uniform units of time. Yes. Uh, and the other thing is that this person just wanted to draw a straight line in there instead of making a more complex curve. Uh, <laughs> so this is the actual figure uh, where we have job loss not by random quarter, but by uh, the when when this um, the, the label data plotted in this case. Um, and so you can see that there is like a, a, a discontinuity discontinuity uh, in in this chart. Uh, and this one is actually the most bizarre that I've ever seen. Uh, the Republican presidential primary schedule. Um, here you have states, and then here you have days of the month, and then color coded the month. Oh, my. Uh, yeah, it's <laughs> somebody made this chart. Um, <laughs> so don't visualize dates or time like this. Even though this visualization, like, it uses bar charts, it uses position, right? Uh, it seems like all of these like fundamental principles that we don't talked about when we talked about marks and channels are followed, but still, it's one of the worst charts imaginable. So even if you draw a chart using all of the principles that we learned so far, um, that could be misleading. So which value, like I'm assuming that this bar here um, visualizes a distribution. So I've run an experiment, I've tried, I've asked um, 100 people what the value of something is, um, and this chart, this bar, represents the mean. Uh, which value do you think is more likely um, to be in drawn from this distribution, A or B? Who's for A? Who's for B? Okay, so I would say three times or four times as many people think it's B than A. If we actually plot a line to measure that and move it up there, we'll see they're exactly the same. And so what, what you've just seen happen live here is what's called within the bar bias. Um, so we tend to, like, if we draw a bar chart like this, and that represents a distribution, then we tend to perceive, like, then we tend to perceive it, um, data values to be more likely uh, in, within the bar. And that is a big problem because if you look at statistics reporting, we very often see bar charts with error bars. And those are actually really misleading. Um, so um, we can plot the data faithfully, but still perceive it wrongly. This would be a different way of, of uh, plotting this data, right? And so here we show the median, uh, and then we show those two values that are drawn from this distribution. Um, and here, like, the people wouldn't say A or B is more likely. They would say this looks about equally as likely. And so people have actually studied that. This is like an experiment from, um, Christoph um, Pentoni and uh, Dale Berger, uh, where they ran a study of these biases. Um, they had like a border shaded, uh, and not shaded, no border, and just these arrow bars. Um, and they gave people questions like I just did with you guys. Um, and you can see that everything except for interval only um, kind of like resulted in uh, estimates that are off the true mean of the distribution. Um, so if you like, Run, like report on statistics in some way, uh, you should like uh, in a distribution. You should usually use like a mean. Um, and you shouldn't use bar charts to represent the distribution, and even the error bars are not helping. So you can like, <laughs> plot like a line. You, you can plot a line with whiskers. Like here, that's a good approach. 
Uh, there's other similar approaches, but you should not use a bar chart to do that. Okay. So, um, one other thing uh, that, like, from a perceptual point of view, uh, plotting a trend line can be helpful, but at the same time, like, we are actually quite good at spotting these trend lines as humans. So, this is like another experiment that was recently run by Michael Correll. Um, and he asked people to dynamically adjust the trend line with a slider, um, and then he evaluated how closely the trend line fit for different conditions. Um, and it turns out that um, humans are actually quite good at fitting a trend line like this, like very, very narrow error ranges. Um, the errors increase um, as the like, correlation is more, um, let's say, more noisy, um, but uh, overall, we are pretty good at doing that. Uh, we're pretty good at doing this for linear trends, for quadratic trends, but even for some trigonometric trends. But we can also like have uh, this within the bar bias if we chose like a wrong chart. Um, so like here, this like um, especially the area area chart on the right here, um, even though it also faithfully plots the data, we are subject to the within the bar bias, and you could actually show that people were biased. Um, towards estimating something is below uh, that uh, trend if you were represented like this. So the next 10 minutes I'll be ranting about pie charts. Um, <laughs> so um, here is a pie chart that shows the share of coverage in tech grants for certain different technology sectors. Um, and this is from uh, like uh, a blog post uh, from Tolmos Barmer, who wrote this book that I recommended in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So your share of coverage on tech crunch. So what, why is this not a great pie chart? <laughs> There's so many categories. There's a lot of categories. <coughs> colors are meaningless. Colors are meaningless, yes. Small. They're too small. The wages are getting really small. Some of them are not even labeled, right? Um, and so we can take a look at, like here would be a slightly improved pie chart where we have actually labeled everything. We've gotten rid of the uh, individual colors that are not particularly meaningful. But still, this might not be the best um, pie chart or not the best visualization for doing that. So we could instead show something like this, right? Uh, we can simply plot a byte pie chart. So what's the argument that people usually bring up for, like, why do I want this to be a pie chart? Exactly. Parts of a whole. That's what, the, what, what you want to show in a pie chart, right? Um, the question is, do you really, is this really that important to show? And doesn't this make sense? Like, doesn't, don't, is this, un, like, can you not make sure that people understand that this is parts of a whole in context? Like, if you say tech branch coverage, um, does it really matter that, um, you don't show that this is really all of the types of articles that TechCrunch covers? Maybe not, right? Maybe a different kind of visualization here um, is more useful. Um, so take a look at those three different pie charts here and just like take a, like 30 seconds and think about whether there's any trends you can see between A, B, and C and I'll ask you in Anybody spot a trend? Yeah. They're rotating. Which is that relevant for the data? So black is smaller in C and also in B. So we have now spend about like a minute thinking about this pie chart, <laughs> um, and and we are still not completely sure what the data is that we're showing. Uh, if I plot it as line chart or as bar charts here, um, I can clearly see what is going on here, right? This is very easy to spot. We see like an upward trend from one to five here, like a probably like random trend uh, from one to five in the middle, and a downward trend from one to five in the other chart. So these colors are not great, um, but uh, generally the bar charts here really communicate um, a, a, a trend, whereas the pie charts are really hard to. This is a pie chart I like, uh, <laughs> um, and this is another pie chart I like by a few people. So one thing that pie charts are particularly bad at is, is at doing these kinds of comparisons. So here is, a, again, from, from Cole Nussbaumer's book, uh, here is a, 
um, an example of uh, a study on um, school kids, whether they were interested in science before some kind of seminar or some kind of like experience uh, and afterwards, where like there was some science or STEM promotion event or whatever. Um, and so students initially said, like, how do you feel about science? Board, not great, okay, kind of interested, excited. And we see, okay, it makes up at 40%, and then it makes up uh, about 14% after this event. Okay, so this, this chart is faithful. Uh, it doesn't show us anything that, like, it doesn't lie in any way, uh, but it doesn't use an ideal visual encoding. So let's, let's look at a couple of design alternatives for that. So we can simply say, after the pilot program, 68% of kids expressed interest towards science compared to 44% going into the program. And we can simply state that, right? This makes the same point as the chart mostly. It doesn't convey all the data, but it's like a faithful representation, and it's maybe a little bit more efficient than making the point in the pie chart. Uh, we could also do like a, like a full on plot of exactly the same data as we had in the pie chart with bar charts. We could say, basically, there were a couple of people that found this event really boring. Uh, <laughs> And, and so the board chart even increased slightly, and also the not grade chart increased slightly, right? But the big thing is that people who didn't really care suddenly started to care. <coughs> and that's something that you can see from that chart. And so this uses bar charts, and again, it's a pretty like, decent way to encode that data. Here's another alternative. Um, I can do stack bar charts, and I can do some grouping. Um, like that's kind of common to, uh, in, in like many sciences or social sciences especially, to kind of lump together a couple of categories. Here we have blue for kind of interested or excited, okay, gray, and dark gray is bored or not gray. And so here we can see clearly the proportional shift between the okay uh, and the kind of interested and excited um, people. And then another way to visualize this is the slope chart. And these slope charts are actually, I do like them a lot for kind of like discrete time points and for making comparisons uh, for these discrete time points. So here we see the slight increase from people that were bored uh, uh, or that didn't find it great. But we see this like um, massive increase uh, from like uh, excited people from 19 to 38% and this massive drop from 14 to 14%. So that is kind of like a, a well-designed chart that shows you exactly the kind of same data. It doesn't show you parts of the whole, right? Uh, but that's not really important for this data set, and it's not really important in many situations. Um, so some more general uh, visualization design principles. You definitely always want to max well. With some caveats, you want to like one principle is maximizing the data to gain ratio. So again, let's go redesign this chart. So first, we'll plot it as a 2D chart instead of a 3D chart with all the shading, and we talked about how 3D is a bad idea. I'll talk more about this later. Um, then uh, we also like took this principle to say, well, we also want to remove extraneous visual visual, uh, visual elements to distract from the message. So we could show this like that. But here are a lot of grid lines, it's quite busy. Um, so we could simply instead remove the grid lines, okay? Uh, that's like a slight improvement. I would say this chart is still quite readable. Maybe I can't read the values as precisely because I lost some of the grid lines. So I could get rid of the background and make it less noisy. I could really get rid of the extraneous frames that I don't need. Um, and then if I want to basically reintroduce the grid lines, I could do those subtle ticks in the bars. Um, instead of having these like heavy grid lines go through it. And now I have a chart that is like as informative and as precise to read as initially with this like grid lines and the background color, but is like focuses on the data, is like aesthetically pleasing, uh, and is very faithful on, on, on communicating what is going on. Um, so what do you think about this? Here are two alternative charts. Uh, and this is like a Nigel Holmes chart. Um, who is like a famous uh, newspaper graphics editor. Um, and so diamonds were a girl's best friend. This is a chart about the price of diamonds um, in the 80s, like from 87 to 82. And we see there's like a spike and then suddenly a decline. Um, and right next to that, we have the same data plotted as a line chart in like our basics graphic. What do you think about those charts? That's who your audience is. 
<laughs> yeah. If it's for a college paper, yeah, the ones to the right. If you're trying to grab people's attention, the ones to the left. Yes. So it also it depends a lot on your focus. But what do you think if I showed this to you, um, and I would ask you like two weeks from now, what's the trend? Do you think there's going to be a difference uh, between one of those two charts in, in the how you memorize the data, how you memorize the trend? Yeah. So uh, here is another uh, example uh, where like a clever design uh, the German problem about like a German trade surplus integrated with the German uh, eagle. Um, here's another one. Uh, expenditures by uh, the House and Senate on campaigns. House and Senate and campaign races, again from the 80s. Again, the Nigel Holmes chart. Like here we have monstrous costs, and here we have the same thing in our base graphics. Um, so all of the supplies here, but like really, um, we can make the case for like this is this violates everything that Edward Tufte believes in, right? Um, all these design principles of draw, show the data, and only the data um, are like. And here we also have some distortion, right? Just because to make a point about the thief, that, like the, uh, this being a monster and not just like a straight baseline. So this is not a chart that is follows these the integrity principles by Tufti. Yet uh, there was a study which was kind of like. Uh, pretty influential on useful chunk, the effects of visual embellishment on comprehension and memorability of charts. Um, and they actually found that um, these like chart chunks, uh, like this, this junk that's added to a chart has a positive effect, effect on memorability. So they came to the conclusion that there is no difference for interpretation accuracy and they tested a couple of those Nigel Holmes charts. There's no difference in recall accuracy after a five minute gap. Um, there is a significantly better recall for the home style, style charts um, for both the chart topic and the details, which are the categories in the trends after two to three weeks. So there's long term memorability benefits. Um, and participants saw a value message in the home chart significantly more often than in the plain charts. So they, these like bring in opinions and values. Uh, participants found that the home charts more attractive. Uh, most of them, most of the participants enjoyed them and found that they were easiest and fastest to remember. Um, so that kind of like um, caused a bit of like a stir in the visualization community, but I think this is mostly um, accepted now. And so, uh, whenever you want to do something like this, you should kind of like think about the pros and cons of the situation, right? Um, the pros are if you want to persuade something, you don't have to. Like, and, and you should not ever resort to lying or being dishonest, but there's no rule against like, you making your opinion seen if it's appropriate, of course. Um, it increases memorability, it increases engagement. Of course, the cons is that you, in, you induce a bias. You kind of like, tell a story that's beyond just the pure data. Um, you might, like your trustworthiness might not be as, as uh, like people might doubt your charts more. Um, the interpretability, even though there wasn't evidence for that in the study, but you could conceivably um, uh, make a case that some of these chart chunks hinder interpretability, and of course they hinder space efficiency. So you kind of have to balance those two um, ideas if you want to design the chart chunk. Um, another thing uh, is, like alignment matters a lot. And we talked about this um, when we talked about the basic visual variables, but here is a chart of like politicians and how often they lie according to political fact. And so it's ranked from Trump, Bachmann, Cruz, Ginger, Palin, and so on. And so it, it's ranked from more lying or less lying. And so this chart faithfully represents the data in a bar chart, but then uh, we could also redesign this chart uh, and align it on like a neutral baseline. Um, and then we can see these trends even more effectively, right? Uh, so we can very clearly spot the proportions of how frequently these politicians lie. Um, we talked about no unjustified 3D before, but I want to go into this in the detail for this now. So uh, first, the first reason why you should not use 3D in charts, uh, not unjustified 3D in charts, is that our depth Adjustment, uh, adjustment is bad. Remember this Stephen's psychophysical power laws where we talked about that the physical intensity of a stimulus does not linearly correlate to the perceived sensation for most 
um, like types of stimulus with the one exception length. Um, and so depth here, uh, we tend to under uh, appreciate <coughs> the depth of a 3D scene. Um, another reason why you shouldn't use 3D is occlusion. So that happens a lot. If you use a 3D scene, you have elements that are occluding each other. Uh, perspective distortion, because you, like if you render on a computer, you actually have to use some perspective distortion, or you, sh like you likely want to use perspective, perspective distortion to make the, the 3D effect um, look good. Uh, and then color uh, will be influenced by lightning, shadows, and, sh uh, and shading. Uh, and then tilted text can become in, 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 illegible. So here are a couple of examples of just like uh, charts uh, that are both 3D and contain chart chunk that I wouldn't consider useful. I guess you, you will probably remember that this is about bananas. Uh, <laughs> but you will likely not remember much about the data. Uh, and all of these other examples are not particularly useful either. Um, here somebody has created 3D pie charts, um, multiple of them, and stack them in some interesting way. Uh, this is there's clearly not this is not the kind of chart chart that I'm talking about when I'm talking about making something memorable. And clearly, the 3D doesn't help here at all. So here's like a design alternative. Like uh, if I want to compare, and uh, we talked about this when we talked about the within the bar bias. Uh, here, if you want to compare like prediction accuracy of your method versus their method, um, for example, and if you like come up with a new machine learning algorithm, uh, you could do this easily with two clicks in Excel and show a 3D bar chart to show that, right? Uh, but more faithful, of course, would be something like this, where you have like a dot plot and error bars or confidence intervals in some way. Um, that is a much more faithful representation. And so the 3D doesn't add anything here, it just distracts from readability uh, in that case. Here's a more extreme case. Here I have like a three-dimensional data set where I have like cell shape uniformity, cell size uniformity, cell comfort thickness. So this is a bio paper in some way uh, in a 3D bar chart. Again, super easy to create in Excel. Uh, here are two redesigns for that. So I could have like a, a matrix where the size of these squares represent the data point, or I could use like saturation or like this linear color scale to encode that. And my personal favorite, like I actually don't think this is like a great chart because it doesn't really show these trends that well. I think this is probably your better, uh, like the best chart here um, on this, uh, for this example. Um, it's not that the, the visualization research community is without sin. Um, this is a paper by two very famous uh, visualization authors, uh, Jörg van Leik and uh, Franklin Hamm, and they're like, a, these are really like, uh, very prestigious authors and researchers in visualization, but back in the uh, like the early days of, of visualization research in 2002, we didn't have the knowledge and the like time in the field. Basically, information visualization, as we're teaching this class, like but if you not talk about statistics, but to talk about computer-based information visualization, started out around 95 or so. Um, and by then, like this is actually a a visualization of a tree data structure, uh, 3D beam charts. Uh, and it was published at one of the most prestigious conferences in our field. Um, of course, now in hindsight, we know that this is like clearly not an ideal visual encoding, but we didn't have the standards back then. Uh, and so my point here being that um, if you will read a visualization paper, especially if it's older, you need to be cautious about uh, how trustworthy it is, even if it appeared in a prestigious journal by good uh, by, by rep uh, reputable authors. Um, one other principle um, that I want to talk about next is this high-speed memory um, principle. So basically, animation is a tricky subject. Uh, so this is a chart of uh, fertility um, in US and Japan compared to each other. Um, what we're showing here is two things. The uh, fertility, like the birth per woman over time, um, uh, the birth per woman, sorry, um, and then at which age these women gave birth. So the like, total number of births is actually encoded in the area. And so that's in 1947, and so we had a total fertility rate per woman of 3.16 children in the US, and then 4.57 children in Japan. And so now we want to look at this over time. So the obvious choice of doing that would be to create an animation, right? 
Okay, so we've done a come full circle. Who like know got what was going on here? So it's it, it, yeah, it's not impossible, right? And we also know that like fertility rates dropped over time, um, and so it, like we can like we can like watch this a couple of times and we'll come to the right conclusions. This is not by itself a bad chart, but it doesn't like this animation makes it really hard for us to compare different time points. Let's say um, if I want to spot the, a, a time point where we had the greatest change in fertility rates, we would probably have to watch this animation 15 times uh, and really think hard about where do we see a massive change, right? Um, and so that's why we say eyes beat memory. We don't want to memorize things um, and compare them to a different time point, but we want to see things at the same time. So what can we do differently with this chart? So we could create this massive matrix of all of those charts laid out. So every frame here is a little blip. Is that a great solution? Why not? It's still not. It's still not. Okay. Yeah, so there's like a lot of charts here. Maybe like the changes from one year to the next one actually don't seem to matter that much. So maybe there is something that I can do uh, to make this more sufficient. So I can create um, a more compact representation here. Right? Like this is what we would call small multiples. Like here I've created, like I picked out, this is like um, not 18 charts or something, or it's three, six, seven, 14 charts um, that represent like snapshots, but they faithfully represent the data. So now I could actually analyze what is going on and making these comparisons and I could see maybe that we see that the, the curve for the US, like here in 1965, it was quite high, but then here by 75, it has actually flattened considerably. So this might be the time where fertility dropped in the US. So this is like, again, a decent chart, but we could also ask ourselves the questions, maybe this is not the right way to show it. Maybe we can kind of transform uh, like this, these charts into something else. And so here is a, a chart, like a, a redesign where we use two different charts. So one chart is the total fertility rate in the US and Japan over time. And that is very easy to spot, right? That we had like a very rapid drop in fertility in Japan between 1950 and 1960, but then it was mostly straight. Um, whereas the US had the baby boomer generation here after the war. Um, and uh, then kind of like um, kept, uh, uh, went downwards and is now slightly above um, above Japan, slowly be uh, slightly below replacement um, at, of two, and then independent of that, the question of the average er, uh, age that a mother gives birth is actually quite independent for that of that, right? So it doesn't really matter that much, um, um, and so here is a different plot for that, and we see that um, the average age used to be. Uh, or in, in, in Japan uh, is, is significantly higher over time, uh, but we also see these trends at the same time, so that the average age right now in Japan is about 30, um, and in 2010 uh, in the US it's about 28. So these are redesigned charts, they don't show every nuance, of, well, they actually probably show most of the data, they don't show the whole distribution in any year, but, but they show like, Probably the message that you want to communicate. Yeah. I was thinking every ten years, could you maybe do just like the error bar of like one standard deviation for the? Yeah. You could also just wanted to show. Yeah, you could also show like a hull here, uh, and and define what this hull is. Um, there is also techniques that are called counter box plots uh, that can allow you to that allow you to show like. Um, these kind of deviations um, in, uh, in in linear like in time series data or in flow data or anything like that. So there's some advanced statistical techniques uh, to do that. Um, and then like temporal data is, is usually like um, small multiples are, are quite useful um, sometimes, but they are also tricky. So here um, are some companies, uh, and like let's just not worry too much about. What the meaning of the axis is doesn't say in this chart. It's a couple of companies. They have um, color values. Uh, they have color code. They are color coded the companies, and we have 2010, 2011, 2012. And so we have a small multiple chart at the top, and then two design alternatives at the bottom. Um, and so it's kind of tricky to trace 
in this chart, like what happened to CBS? It started out here, then it went down a little bit, and maybe a little bit to the right, then it went down a little bit further. So, like, you have to actually move your eyes and think about uh, CBS very, very consciously. Um, here is a design alternative where there is some, like, uh, slide, like, there's basically, we've created now uh, these seven different color chart, or color, um, color code scales um, to encode that. So you can see that CBS actually, like, um, started out high and then went down. Uh, and you can see these other companies too. Or you could do these tails uh, for this bar chart and kind of show, like, a um, residual uh, uh, over time for these companies. And so I think that is a quite interesting method. What is the problem with this method? So the tail, the half of the tail isn't necessarily what actually happens. Yes, that's one problem. So we have some curves, like there's some interpolations that could happen. What other problem? The points for 2010 and 2011 were exactly the same. Yeah. But what would happen if I had, let's say, instead of seven companies, 30 companies? So like these, these tails, they need a lot of space, right? So we, we are much more limited now in how many items we can show in a chart like this. And so in your homework, for example, in the Gapminder, um, we, we do like a time slider um, where you, I actually didn't show that in the video, but I can show this quickly. So here we do like this get minus style time slider. Uh, I'm mapping total fertility rate versus GDP. And so I'm doing exactly this temporal animation, right? And so this is kind of hard to keep track of. You see these major trends, uh, but it's a bit tricky. And so like um, we didn't want to make you do it, but uh, in the end, like having a selected country um, and showing the trail of that selected country would be a pretty cool solution. For one country, you can see the trend, right? Just makes it a little bit more complicated, so we're like compromising here uh, to make it a little bit simpler. Uh, but the proper gap matter on their website actually has it implemented. You see the pass of a select. Okay, so uh, I want to use the last twenty minutes to do a redesign. Uh, can you guys hand out, um, I'll briefly introduce this, um, this data, uh, this, this visualization here. This is from a New Zealand newspaper. Um, what we see here is, what do you think are the most important problems facing New Zealand today? New Zealand today, and this is a temporal data set. We have unemployment jobs, the economy, crime, violence, and race relations. And this part uh, does that over time. And so you'll get your handout soon. What I'd like you to do is first do an analysis of this chart um, and then come up with two redesigns.
Anybody needs scratch paper, just like shout at us up here and we'll come back and give you a sheet. All right?
So we have essentially opinions on what are the most important issues. How is the data encoded? Like what, what, what data types do we have? So we have time series data, but also we have these different questions. Right? So how is this data encoded? I couldn't hear the second part. So the color, I get, they kind of group them into two categories, like unemployment and economy, right? So they have like the color, but like the top two kind of fall maybe in the same category and then the bottom two kind of fall under yeah. the same category. Okay, so, um, and so the, the encoding you said is color yeah. for the questions, and what was it, what else? So area for like the results. Is that true? No, the radius or radius. It's radius, yes. yes. Uh, and so remember last lecture we talked about how deceiving it can be if we encode the data um, in a chart, uh, in a bubble chart with radius. And so that's also something that you'll have to take care of um, in your homework, for example, because it's quite easy to set up a scale for the diameter. It's a little bit more tricky to set up a scale for the area of a circle. We're actually giving you the scale, I think, right? Um, so, but just we'll take a look at how, to, how, how we set up the scale so that you don't make that mistake. Okay, so anybody over there? Is what other other encodings here, or like some other special way of encoding the data? Time with label. At least it's a sequential, right? <laughs> um, so why do you think they like the Afro look of these bubble charts? Any, any <laughs> comments on that? Maybe on this side here of the room. Yeah. I mean, they're putting the smaller ones in the front. Yeah. And then they tie. They put the, the flat one in front. Of it. Yeah. So that gets really tricky. Right here, like basically, you have to break your convention. This tells us that this was probably created in Illustrator, not in a computer program, because this case, special case here is tricky to handle, right? Um, and then another problem we have with these, like, small, like, our, like, basically we have to have special cases for, like, starting at 3%, the bubbles get too small to label them inside. Something like that happens frequently, of course. 
Um, and so the problem that we can clearly see uh, with the different scales uh, is this like here we see this 8 versus 10% um, isn't quite um, like a, a great, uh, like the proportion between 8 and 10% isn't particularly useful. Um, so one thing we see, of course, is that um, what we see in this chart is that around the financial crisis, suddenly the economy became a big deal, right? Um, and compared to that, crime, violence, and race relations have kind of like, uh, were on a downward slope in the public's perception as the most important problem. Um, yet, that's not necessarily totally easy and intuitive to spot. So what were your, like, um, or maybe let's ask a question first, like, do you like this chart? Do you think that this design, like we talked about how sometimes it's justifiable to break with some conventions, like chart trunks, does that fall into this justifiable category? category? <coughs> so it does not, definitely, because first you got like the visual encoding of size wrong, right? That's like a great mistake. Um, but then also, uh, it's just like not necessarily well designed for temporal data. Can somebody like um, discuss how they redesigned that? Uh, I plotted it as two pairs of lines and then I also plotted a line indicating the other responses. So it's not clear here what percentages of folds are being uh, communicated. Yeah. So it's just uh, horizontal axis is years, vertical axis is, is percent, and then you have uh, two pairs of lines that yeah, color by color and shape. And so did you do like a precise mapping? Like could you see this 2008 trend very clearly in your chart? <coughs> <laughs> okay. Um, anybody else have uh, a bar chart? A bar chart. Um, and so, how did you like lay out your bar chart? Like uh, for each problem, each color. Mm -hmm. And for uh, the examples, they are the years. Okay. Yeah. So that would be like a, a reasonable solution. Um, here is like a a redesign uh, that where the quantity is encoded by the uh, like uh, this is the quantity encoded by diameter, um, and now we have to re like redesigned it here by area, and so you can see like uh, these differences that like for example six versus twenty eight percent is becoming much less apparent. Um, but of course, um, like plotting it as a line chart is probably quite a good solution. So you see, um, like here I'm only plotting crime, violence, and race relations. You see that there was probably some like major incident in the news in New Zealand around 2003, uh, which kind of resulted in this rise of this perception. So, but like a line chart here is quite a reasonable solution. And I want to show you one of your or, or two charts that, that some of you have drawn. Like here we see this line chart um, where we actually can see the economy uh, spiking. It's a little hard to, to see, but we have four lines. Uh, in here, and then you can see that the economy really takes off um, as this, um, as this, like the most important issue for people in New Zealand. Um, and so um, there is a second drawing that is quite like basically similar. Um, here we have like either a stacked bar chart or a line chart. So this is the kind of thing that we'll also have on the exam, uh, and um, that concludes it for today. And I'll see you guys on Tuesday.